Hello and welcome to the next instalment of the Franklin College podcast, where today I'm joined by the lovely Melanie On, and we're going to be asking her some questions submitted by students. So, Melanie, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself first? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Melanie On, and I was the Labour Member of Parliament for Great Grimsby between 2015 and 2019 for three general elections. Uh, and since then, I have gone on to become the deputy CEO of a trade association called Renewable UK, and have recently moved on to uh, become a senior advisor for a communications agency called Blakely Group. Thank you. So, shall we get started with the questions? So, our first question is, if you were an MP again, what changes would you put in place? Well, I've been selected to be the Labour candidate by Labour members here again, which I'm incredibly proud of. Um, and I think that what I've heard over recent years, and one of the reasons why I wanted to put myself forward, is because at the moment, people in Grimsby don't feel like they are being properly represented and they don't feel like they've got a Member of Parliament who is visible or who is accessible or who's raising the issues that they want to hear being raised at a parliamentary level. So those would be the, the key priorities really to make sure that people in Grimsby can get hold of me, they see me around, they know that I'm connected with what's happening in the local area and hopefully they already know that um, I've got a voice that's loud enough to carry in Parliament uh, and bring changes that they want to see. Now you were an MP before, um, so what would be the most difficult aspect of being an MP when you previously were? It's, um, I mean, it's, a, it's not really a job, mm. and I think people forget that. It, it is a vocation, so it's a seven day a week, almost 24 hours a day type role, um, if you're doing it right. Uh, and I think that that's the toughest part of it, really, because you don't get much downtime. Um, I've quite enjoyed having my weekends mm. back, so I'm <laughs> getting used to the idea that I'm going to be back out on the campaign trail, yeah. uh, you know, meeting constituents and uh, visiting businesses, seeing what local organisations are doing. Uh, so that's quite difficult. Yeah. But also there are some really challenging decisions that you have to make as a Member of Parliament. You know, obviously in the, the time that I was there, we had the 2016 referendum on leaving the European Union and that was really, really mm. challenging because I... That I thought and I felt that you know we should stay a member of the European Union, but I knew that Grimsby was going to vote to leave the European Union, and so there was a tension, and it was really difficult, really personally very challenging because you want to represent your constituency, but also you've got a job to do in terms of trying to communicate why you think that that might not be the right thing for this area. Um, so you yeah. know it puts you in conflict, and that is uh, you know that's that's difficult. You lose sleep over things like that. Yeah. Speaking of our constituents and Grimsby, what would you do to level up Grimsby once in power? Well, I think there's lots of things that actually need to happen um, to, to properly level up because we've got some really deep-seated issues in Grimsby. Not, I mean, we're sat in a fantastic uh, studio here at Franklin College and it's great to see that there's been some investment going into mm. the area and you've got some uh, expanded new spaces for students, which makes it the kind of place that people want to come and want to learn. Um, and we need more of that across all education sites. And I think one of the big things is about skills, particularly for people who have been out of work for some time or people who've been in work but want to change uh, the work that they're doing so that they've got more opportunities and they've got more uh, steps to, to grow, to get a better paid job or move into a long-term career. So there's things like that, but there's also about bringing more inward investment inward investment into Grimsby because that again kind of grows those job opportunities, links in with the skills as well and there's fundamentally something quite uh, tricky about how connected we are both within the town and beyond the town. Yeah. Um, our connectivity is quite poor um, so making sure that transport links work uh, so that it works for individuals so they can move about freely uh, so that it works for local businesses and boosts the local economy. Um, but there's, you know, there's other things around health inequalities. I don't think that we can ever be considered to be levelled up unless we realise that you know, we've, we've got above average numbers of children who are living in poverty. Um, we've got health inequalities that mean that we die earlier or that we're living longer with more serious illnesses. And tackling some of those fundamental societal issues uh, should be up there to make sure that you know, we are punching at the same weight as other places around the country. Mm. Now, this is a more of a local matter that has been highly requested, and forgive me, I'm going to read it off the sheet because I'd like to get the details correct. People are asking what your opinion is on the closing of three of our local nurseries, being Scartho Nursery School, the Reynolds Street Nursery and Greatcoats Village mm -hmm. Nursery, that are all under consultation with plans to close from the 31st of August this yeah. year. 
what would you do to try and save these schools? Or Well, that's not the question. That isn't the question, Finlay. The question is, what did I do to stop what them from being closed previously? What because the, these are state-maintained nursery yes. schools in the heart of communities, communities that are actually growing. If you look mm. at Scarthoe, you look at Great Coach, you look at um, uh, the area around Reynolds Street and Cleethorpes, they are all growing. You know, we're seeing more people moving into those areas, more estates. Actually, that could, that's going to mean more families mm. and more children. So when I was the MP, uh, funding for early years was already being cut and limited. And I worked really closely with uh, Helen Hussey, who was the principal of Great Coats Nursery School, to make sure that they got additional funding. Now, there was a limit on that funding, and obviously that's come to an end. And I've been really disappointed, actually, to see that uh, since 2019, we're in 2023 now, it's four years, um, nothing has been said about the estate maintained nurseries. Mm. So it's just been not part of anything that uh, local representatives have been doing to uh, try and make sure that these can continue because I've been in mm. to that nursery in Great Coats in particular um, and have seen the fantastic work they do. And they've got kids in there who cannot get into any other nursery because of their special needs. Mm. And so it's just gonna make it even harder for parents. And I saw the statement from the local portfolio yeah. holder at the council saying, oh, it's all right, we've got private provision, we've got volunteer provision um, and other settings. And I don't think that that's good enough because once these things go, that's it. You just, you know, you really have to fight so hard to get them back. And we used to have absolutely brilliant early years. And if mm -hmm. you don't support early years, I mean, we've lost Shore Start centres, for example. If you don't support those early years, and, and have a, a level playing field for all kids, actually what you get is uh, some children who just don't receive the kind of support, education and mentoring that they need mm. in those early years when they learn the most. And it's not just about learning how to count, it's not just about mm. learning how to read, it's the really basic stuff, you know, it's, yeah. it's motor skills, it's getting on with one another, it's developing teamwork, it's improving their communication. Uh, learning to eat well and properly, it, it really, really simple things, mm. but those schools do them so well. Mm. Um, so I would absolutely be out there fighting for it. I, I previously have taken principals down to meet the Secretary of State, um, and I'm amazed that that hasn't happened this time. Mm. It is a shame, really, but we're going to move on slightly towards our college, Franklin. Uh, what are Labour's intentions towards funding with sixth form colleges such as Franklin? Well, I mean, it's very difficult to yeah. kind of give commitments at the moment because we're, we're some way out from a general election. Once mm -hmm. we get the manifesto, we'll get all of the details. But for as long as I've been a member of the Labour Party and previously when I was a member of Parliament, I, alongside lots of other Labour members, were supporting the Fair Funding for Further Education campaign uh, because we recognised that it was a kind of uh, an unsung hero mm -hmm. of education, that bridge between leaving school and moving into the world of work or moving into university uh, and it really had been underfunded it yeah. really had been forgotten kind of left to fend for itself um, and I just think it's such a shame because it's uh, you know it's a critical point in young people's lives so really need the support and need high quality provision but also a range of provision as well because I think that that's one of the things that we've seen lots of courses have been cut and I think for places like Grimsby we want to give young people as many opportunities as possible and that means having as many courses available as possible for them to pursue what they want to do for, for a living when they get older. Speaking of courses I'm going to skip ahead ever so slightly to what do you think about the government's move from A levels to T levels mm. being rolled out shortly do you think they're going to be a good qualification or? Well I mean, T-levels have been rolled out already. We've got some that are underway, mm. but they're proving to be quite problematic. Yeah. And I think that the principle behind it is quite good because it shouldn't just be an academic route that young people have facing them. It doesn't suit everybody. You know, no. some people learn at different rates and learn in different ways and they want to gather different skills. And if I think about the world of work, what I've been doing, for example, for the last 25 years, doesn't really require any qualifications whatsoever. Mm. You know, it is uh, a lot of on the job kind of uh, experience that, uh, that's, that's given me the skills that I need to, to progress. But those technical um, levels that have been uh, rolled out by the government, they are not properly supported, they're not properly funded, they are not seen as an attractive option by young people at the moment. So it's been rolled out poorly. Mm. Uh, so I think that there needs to be a rethink and I know that they're looking at kind of expanding them into new areas. And I can't help but think that probably 
um, expanding something that already isn't working, isn't the best of ideas, and they probably should go back to the drawing board. But I really do support technical routes, apprenticeships, training, and I think that's one of the things that employers um, should be supported in doing, is not just offering um, apprenticeships, but actually having proper training schemes and not just looking at graduate training schemes either. Give on-the-job training for a whole variety of different roles uh, and then support young people in education at the same time. And I think that that would work really well. So I'm going to move on to our next question. Well, what, what do you think, think about, about that? that? What do I no, think no, of yeah. T-levels? Yeah. I think that they're going to be quite difficult with the uh, different areas. So in Grimsby, I would like to progress further into media, but there aren't a lot of media sort of outlets and stuff around here. I'd love to go work in radio, but the, I believe the closest like professional radio is BBC Hall mm -hmm. to work on. I've tried Grimsby Hospital Radio and all that sort of stuff but they haven't got bad to me. But, um, <laughs> but sort of stuff like that, but say if you're doing something engineering or something related to that, there is a lot more opportunity for things like yeah. that around here and health and social, that sort of thing. But other mm -hmm. areas have better, say if you were going to London, obviously it's going to have a myriad of all the different things that you wanted to do compared mm -hmm. to Grimsby. And we've got, so in Bradford, for example, they've mm. got a uh, film institute, mm. Manchester, obviously, you've got Salford Media City. Those are the kind of places that you'll end up kind of focusing yeah. on, presumably, as you yeah. get older. Yeah. yeah, so you'll be part of our brain drain problem. Yeah, going I off and being so. successful elsewhere, you hope so. <laughs> Maybe you'll come back. We'll come back eventually. <laughs> now, moving on to our next one. Will, I know you can't give definites and stuff at the minute, but what would you say to Labour? Would they ensure teachers and teaching staff are paid fairly? And will working conditions and the educational curriculum be looked at and changed, such as if, regarding issues such as workload? Um, I mean, Labour is very, very close to uh, teaching trade unions um, and, and understands the pressures that, that teachers are under. And I think I'm, I'm hesitant about saying right. that we will completely overhaul the curriculum because mm. I feel like teaching staff at every level will just go, oh my God, don't do that. Because every time you do something really deeply structural, mm. it puts even more pressure on, on teachers and teaching support staff. Um, so I think that... The route that Labour want to go is making sure, yes, that everybody who's working in the public sector is paid fairly um, and that that is recognised and that is done through a national agreement. So hopefully we won't have the kind of strikes that we've seen happening yeah. in recent years because that's really disruptive. And I know teachers don't want to be going on strike either, but it is disruptive to, to kids' education. Um, and when it comes to the curriculum, I think that we have become increasingly aware that there is um, a big pressure around exams and performance and bureaucracy within mm. uh, the profession. So looking at that, looking to ease the burden, and I would like to see, I used to work for a trade union called Unison and we used to represent teaching assistants across the whole country. And teaching assistants are some of the most undervalued people working in education. Yeah. You know, they, they are paid a fraction, they are often expected to uh, step up to teaching levels uh, without getting the recognition or reward. Um, and I think that when it comes to supporting uh, young people, having teaching assistants and support, uh, classroom support assistants, as well as thinking about all the technicians that you've got when you get into um, college education, uh, making sure that they are properly remunerated for the work that they do, the skills that they have, and the knowledge that they are sharing yep. is absolutely the right thing to do. So, part two. Let's start with everyone's favourite topic. The one that stirs the pot the most and has the most opinions, Brexit. So one of our questions submitted was, can you envisage a point in time where the Labour Party will have courage to admit that Brexit has been a mistake and will actively advocate for the UK's re-entry to the European Union? Uh, well, I just say I know you can't speak on behalf of the party on all the time and stuff, but... Yeah. Yeah. What no, would you I've personally I've never let that say? stop me, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd just say... 2016, we had the mm. referendum, um, yeah. and we were told at the time, we'll have this referendum, we'll leave the EU, and then we'll never need to think about it ever again. Mm. Um, and one of the reasons I supported remaining was yeah. because I just said that it's not a realistic option. No. We will still be talking about it. You can't have a union that's been built over 40 years, that's incrementally got closer and closer, you know, tied nations together in the biggest post-war project that the world has ever and then seen leave like that. and then leave like that yeah. yeah and so I think it'll be a decade where we're still mm. talking about it um, well, we are still talking about it we're exactly. talking about it now no, we're talking about it now and uh, you know so obviously it's still yeah. an issue of interest and I don't know whether it is I don't know whether it's a labor responsibility to say that it was a mistake um, I think that what we 
I mean, there was a referendum. That was a decision that was taken, and I think it's right to honour that, because if mm. you start reneging on referendums, then what's the point of democracy? There could be a point in the future where we have another referendum. Mm. don't know when that might be, though, because I don't think that tempers have calmed sufficiently. Now, how many prime ministers have we gone through now? That. Yeah, that's true. There have been quite a lot of prime ministers since that, <laughs> since David Cameron. <laughs> they were on, like, the fifth one now. Yeah. Um, so... I think that what we need to do, actually, is focus on how we can continue to have a positive relationship with the EU. Because I'm not even sure the EU would be open to having the United Kingdom back as a member. Because we've messed because them was, around so much. Yeah, and, uh, you know, so it's almost like the arrogance of assuming that, mm. you know, Labour get into government, we say, oh, mere culpa, it was the Tories. Can, mm. we, have bre- uh, can we undo Brexit now, please? And they say and no. And I'm just... I'm just, yeah, I'm not convinced. Mm. And, and I, I listened to a really great podcast the other day with Mary McAleese, who used to be the president in Ireland. Mm. She was phenomenal. And she was talking about it, and she was just saying the amount of time that the EU gave over to dealing with Brexit was unprecedented mm. for a country that we always believed, just hit my microphone, um, that we always believed we were a bit part player and mm. we were being dictated to. But actually, we were so instrumental to it that for the most part, over four years, the EU devoted most mm. of its time, most of the debating time, when they should have been talking about other things. You know, people get upset about the common agricultural policy, common fisheries policy. Um, you've got uh, floods and you've got drought and you've got wildfires happening all over Europe. You've got a, a war on their doorstep. Mm. They've got other things to be talking about. Well, you say that, but then we got the beautiful blue passports in return didn't we? <laughs> that Boris Johnson advertised. I've, uh, yeah, that are made in the EU, I think, mm. not made in the UK. <laughs> well, so we're going to move on to some more choices. So, if elected to government, would Labour repeal the abortion laws from the 1860s and give women control of their own bodies? Oh, this is a really current issue, isn't it? This I was a that, yeah, I question. suspect that this has come in because uh, the, there's been a, a case of a woman who has just been sent to prison mm. because she... Um, yeah, I saw that in the news. Yeah, she secured some abortion pills during lockdown um, following a telephone mm. appointment with a GP. and um, It was a few weeks past the legal... Quite a f- yeah, yeah, I think it was at I think it was thirty six. I think it was at thirty six weeks, yeah. and so you've only got you know, or thirty two weeks. So you've got forty weeks of pregnancy. Mm. It was really late on yeah. when she did that for a whole myriad of reasons. I think that um, there hasn't been a decision made on it, mm. but personally, because I think it is a personal thing. And one of the, when I came to Franklin when I was a student, yeah. I I was a real big like women's rights campaigner, and you know, every um, really do support abortion as a health care. Um, healthcare provision um, and I think that that is the way that it should be looked at so it should be mm. decriminalised um, because I don't believe that any woman takes abortion so lightly in any circumstance mm. that um, you know they use it as a method of birth control you know I just mm. don't, I just don't believe that that is the case um, personally I'm a pro-choice where you know why do we get the say on what individuals get to do with their own bodies it's mm. In, inside them, they get to choose. Why should a government sat in Parliament in London get to say what they do with the fetus inside of them? Yeah, I mean, it's a really emotive issue. Mm. Um, and, you know, I understand that, particularly in this case, you know, the, the fetus was a viable child, mm. you know, and that's where people start to get very, very um, concerned, yeah. particularly with the advances in, in medical treatment, mm. that you, you know, can have a, a, a baby born at four and a half months mm. that's still viable um, as, a, as a, a living, breathing yeah. person. Um, so where's that line between you know, abortion and, and infanticide? So I think that, but I do think it should be decriminalised and I think that in this case, I mean, it was an extraordinary period of time during lockdown, um, but you know, the, the woman actually needs um, mental health support, not sending to prison because no. that doesn't do anything for society. It doesn't do anything for the children that she still has left at home, one mm. of whom is disabled. In my opinion, it's a bit backwards. It sort of defeats the whole purpose yeah, well of people, trying to help people. Yeah, and I think if, you know, from the UK's perspective, and it's, a, it's a law that's 150 years old, mm. but looking at what happened in America with the uh, repeal of Roe versus Wade, mm. 
Now, to get an abortion in some states in America, it is almost impossible. People are having mm. to cross state lines to go and get health care. Even Isn't that, that a crime itself? Even that yeah. can be a crime. Getting a referral from another doctor yeah. can be a crime, so the doctor is committing crime. And we look kind of astonished that that is the case. Mm. But increasingly, with uses of laws like this mm. and without reviewing perhaps an easy way for the government, the government could take action now, of course, don't yeah. need to wait for a Labour government, uh, which hopefully will come in next year. The government could now look at sentencing guidelines because it can't make any decisions in a particular case, but could look at sentencing guidelines and say, in actual fact, um, this is something that does not require jail time. And we will leave it up to judges to um, decide on uh, a different kind yeah. of uh, punishment or, uh, you know, some kind of uh, restitution, because the judge in this case said he was bound by the sentencing guidelines to issue a custodial sentence. Mm. I mean, look, we still have laws about shaking a doormat outside after nine o'clock in the evening. Yeah, so something we could do about with, uh, carrying sheep over from Wales that mm. allows you to be shot or something. Yeah, so something yeah. silly <laughs> like that. So we could do with a good look through of all the laws. But um, so we spoke earlier about the UK being unstable. So we're going to get into everyone's favourite topic at the minute, the cost of living crisis. Mm -hmm. So this is about students and okay. the cost of living crisis. Yeah. So regarding the cost of living situation and the financial situation for independent students, should the minimum wage be raised for those under the age of 18 who live independently, study and work, but do not have family support or access to benefit allowances due to their age? Uh, I think the minimum wage should be um, should be a flat minimum wage. It shouldn't mm. be discriminated against because of your age. I was one of those independent students without family support when I was coming here. I was living independently at the age of probably 16 and a half, 17. Um, I had the benefit of an education maintenance grant. Mm. Those don't exist anymore. No. Um, or an allowance. It wasn't even a grant. It was an allowance. I didn't have to pay it in back. sociology. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and I had... Um, access to uh, benefit support, a support worker, um, lots of things, free, uh, actually I didn't get free transport because I was just short of a mile as the fly crows from where yeah. I was living to the college, but you know, I could have accessed, if I was living slightly further away, um, could have accessed free transport. Um, so there are lots of things that can be put in place for young people at the moment that are, are, not, um, are not still available as they were to me. Um, but yeah, addressing that minimum wage issue, and I also think that you know the, the government has mm. renamed the minimum wage the living wage, and I think it's it's just not true. Mm. There is a national living wage. There's mm. a commission that sets what the national living wage is, and what we have is a minimum wage, mm. um, and we wholeheartedly discriminate against young people mm. regardless of their circumstances because whether you're 24 or whether you're 17 you can be living in exactly mm. the same uh, set of circumstances you could have uh, a child and, de and dependents um, you could be living independently so I had pleasure. a question um, from one of my English teachers it was something to do with yesterday they voted in the House of Lords uh, the Labour's voted. Yes, I got a message about this. So I can't, I can't quite recall what it was, but I think it was their I protest. Guess where I was yesterday? In oh, the House of Lords. Yeah. I was sat in the House of Lords. So um, I saw what was going on yeah. like, from behind the scenes on this one. And um, so a Green member of the House of Lords, Jenny mm. Jones, um, set a rather mischievous uh, set of um, procedures in motion so she came up with something that's called a fatal motion yes. which is something that is designed to kill the government uh, bill um, that is not the role of the house of lords mm. the house of lords is unelected uh, it's there as a revising chamber it's yeah. not there as a decision maker yeah so when the government puts through legislation the process is that you know it goes to the house of lords for review um, it gets sent back to the Commons, it goes to committees so that committees can scrutinise it and try and make changes. It goes back to the House of Lords again. Um, you get something called ping pong. If mm. there is something really controversial, we got it a lot through Brexit, um, where pieces of legislation would just go backwards and yeah. forwards all the time, um, exhaustingly, uh, just changing minute words to try and um, improve it from mm. the Lords' perspective. And they're much more collaborative in the Lords than they are in the Commons. Yeah. Um, so what she did was try and dictate through a fatal motion that would kill the government's policy. The government, whether I like it or not, is democratically elected. Mm. It's got a right to put in place policies that it wants to put in place. So from a Labour perspective, we don't think that what the government is doing is right. But equally, 
the methods by which uh, Baroness Jones went about trying to stop it. Really, it was just a bit of attention seeking from the mm. part, on the part of the Baroness. And what Labour did was put forward a motion of regret, um, which was to say that, you know, we regret the action that the government is taking around this, um, uh, around this bill. Um, they're using a statutory instrument, which I think is the first time they've ever done it, rather than using primary legislation, um, which is problematic in itself. So government, go back, think again. Mm. Um, and that got support from across the House of Lords. Mm. So that's not Labour saying, you know, we're clamping down on protests and we don't want trade union strikers mm. um, having uh, the opportunity to voice their concerns at all. It is a procedural matter. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, because my English teacher was worrying, uh, yeah. wondering about that. Oh. Now, the last question is about the Red Wall. Mm -hmm. And do you see it re-establishing itself come the next general election? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I mean... The last general election was Labour's worst ever defeat. Mm. Um, some people were absolutely shocked that we lost Grimsby, but in the same way as I kind of saw the outcome of the referendum, I yeah. saw the writing on the wall mm. um, at the last general election. Um, so I think that things have changed significantly, um, not least you know the, the kind of the chaos and difficulties within the Conservative Party. Um, but also the fact that you know Labour is presenting itself as uh, as a government in waiting, much more credible leadership, mm. um, much more responsible. We've got to appeal to a whole wide range of people. It's not just lifelong Labour voters that we need to get back on board, but it's also those swing voters, pre people who uh, chose to vote con Conservative last time. Perhaps even at the general election before yeah. and the general election before that, we need them to come over. Uh, to support Labour, to make sure that we get a majority government, and that isn't assured. Mm. You know, it isn't assured. A lot can change in politics. A week yeah. is a long time in politics. You know, we've seen three Conservative resignations over the course of uh, of the weekend. Um, <laughs> so you know, it, it. Who knows? It's uh, mm. you know, it's a, it's quite a long way off. Um, hopefully, Rishi Sunak will call a general election sooner rather than later, and we yeah. can get on with it. Well, thank you for speaking with me today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to host you. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. You can view this episode online somewhere. somewhere. I don't know. I don't know yet. We haven't worked that part out. But yeah, thank you so much for coming.